Yes. Before you went over to Nuremberg, did you did the name Roger Jackson, or Robert Jackson, mean anything to you? As you know, from your how we am? Yeah, oh. we're am. Um. Yes, I had read his op opinions uh, in law school and and in practicing law. Right. And he was obviously. A remarkable person uh, and a beautiful opinion writer. You you graduate from this area. You're from here, right, Roger? I, I'm from a mile from here, and I've lived here all my life. Uh, I went to Northwestern. Uh, I went to Princeton. Right. And then I went to Northwestern Law School, and then I started to practice in Chicago. Were you destined to be a lawyer? Yeah, my father was a trial lawyer too. Right. And I always knew I wanted to do that. And, of course, this is, you would have graduated from law school in 1940? That's right. 1940, and you had a chance to practice law. What kind of law did you practice? Trial work. Trial work? Trial work. And then guess what happens in the meantime? Well, and what happened is, then I... Uh, went into the army mm -hmm. uh, as a as an as a private, and had my basic training, and <coughs> then went into the military police, mm -hmm. and uh, I struggled hard because we all the battalion stood in line and marched forward, and they looked at your teeth and they looked at your posture. <laughs> And the company clerk finally said, where you're going to go is to guard the president if you get picked. So I figured that was a great assignment. And I did my best and I got it. But it didn't mean, I thought that we were going to go to Yalta or someplace like that. Right, right. It was in a white box in front of the White House. <laughs> Our job was guarding the president. Did you ever have a chance to see the president? I don't remember. Yeah. But I, I wangled me into doing wangled my way into doing undercover work, ah. and so I was doing undercover work uh, in the military district of Washington, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and then I saw a place that said OCS, JAG OCS, right? And I went in and tried to get in, and finally managed to get into Officer Candidate School in Ann Arbor, and then I got uh, my <clears throat> second lieutenant, and I was assigned to the International Law Division uh, in Washington. And then, much to my surprise, I got orders to leave and go to, go to London. And I started to complain. They said, this is signed by the Secretary of War. You've got to go. So I, I, was, I went to London. Do you know how that happened? How did, the, yes. how did Roger Barrett? Yes. One of, the, of my fellow classmates in the officer candidate school, mm -hmm. Melvin Siegel, was a brilliant attorney general under Jackson. Right. And Jackson, and when he was appointed, immediately picked him to go to Nuremberg, and he said something to him about, do you know anybody else that would be good? And Mel and I had become good friends in law school, and he gave him my name. No kidding. And that, by that slim thread. Did you have any idea what you were buying into? No. <laughs> and I had no idea what the Germans had done and what the war crimes were. Uh, when I got to London, there were only a half a dozen people there, including Jackson. Right. Who were those half a dozen? Commander Albrecht, Telford Taylor, uh, Bob Story, uh, General William Donovan. Mm -hmm. 
Um, that were the main ones. And they spent their time meeting with other country representatives to decide who should be the defendants and what kind of a trial it should be. And the, the British wanted to court-martial them. Right. Uh, the, the Russians wanted to shoot them. Uh, and Jackson wanted to have a kind of a trial that would stand up and, with records and uh, it would meet the stand, standards of the American judicial system. Mm -hmm. uh, I was invited to the Big Shots conference once or twice. So this is the, this is the conference where everybody was around the square table. I've seen that on, on, on the History Channel where the Russians, the, the French, and the British, you were at that? Yes. Yeah. I sat behind uh, Colonel Story, who was my immediate commanding officer. And uh, the only thing I remember about it is that about four in the afternoon, one of the British said, let's stop for tea. <laughs> and General Donovan took off his coat and said, Let's decide who the first witness is going to be and who's going to examine him. Let's get on with the show. But General Donovan didn't get the kind of an assignment he wanted. And uh, so he left uh, pretty soon. Now, at the London conference there, what was your role? Were you assisting and in gathering information? Yes, but uh, uh, I went to MI6, British Intelligence and collected information. They had underground, uh, they had spies. And uh, also, information started to come in. Right. And Jackson and the other big shots would say, you know, send it down in the basement to Barrett. And I was the collector of all the, doc all the material as it was collected. So this was all in London. Yes. And you, so you're working basically with the British government, the MI6. Yes. And how are they getting their documents? Where are they getting them from? Well, uh, the documents I saw were documents that were developed during the war by spies. Ah. Uh, but I didn't come under any great mass of documents. But pretty soon, the OSS started sending documents in. And uh, then American soldiers, all the, the troops over there, the intelligence people were collecting documents. And uh, the potential defendants were put in two camps called Ash Can and Dust Bin. Now, uh, Ashcan, was that the Mondorf Palace in Luxembourg? Is that where the defendants were taken? Do you, you remember that? Is that what Ashcan was? I know when Gehring was arrested and Riefenstahl, yes. they're all taken to a palace. Yes. yes. And uh, the significant thing was that the toilets were, were, bu were bugged. Oh, is that right? And they allow the defendants after their examinations to go in the toilet together and then they'd bug and, and they'd, the, the defendants would say they didn't ever ask me about the uh, British, uh, the German naval documents. They didn't ask a question about it. <laughs> so the next time uh, it would be picked up. But uh, they, the archives that were captured were so tremendous. Mm -hmm that uh, the problem was to sort out the very best of everything. So your offices were originally in London? On Mount Street. Mount Street? Yes. And what did your staff consist of? Just me. <laughs> <laughs> so you literally were, were there at the beginning? Yes, yes. I, I, I uh, you know, you know I, uh, I would confer with Jackson and also, there was a little group with Colonel Street and Murray Bernays. Mm -hmm. uh, does that name ring a bell? Right, it sure yeah. does, yeah. And, uh, 
Andy Wheeler. And the four of us worked together. Right. Uh, unfortunately, Murray Bernays, who was one of the architects mm -hmm. of the trial, didn't get what he wanted, and so he left and went home. What did he want? What was his goal? A more important role. Is that right? Yeah. Was there a lot of that going on, people jockeying for position with Jackson to basically get in the hierarchy? Well, there were two kinds of lawyers. Mm -hmm. Brilliant lawyers who became Harvard professors like Ben Kaplan, Warren Farr, uh, Mel Siegel, who were just there for, uh, because of their brain power, Sam Harris. And then there were those that well, were politicians and hoped to enhance their career. Mm -hmm. Tom Dodd was one of those, right. although he's an awfully nice guy, okay. but he wasn't up to the level of some of the others. Mm -hmm. And there were one or two others who were political and were using this to enhance their career. And there was not much contact between those two groups of guys. The hard-working, bright guys just worked hard and bright. Right. I saw a list not so long ago, and maybe we're jumping ahead, but this was a uh, list of September 7th, 1945, of uh, some of the folks at Nuremberg. And I wondered if you uh, have any thoughts regarding some of those folks who were positioned early on, obviously before the trial started, Yeah, Frank Shea was uh, another important role, although he'd had a political background. Right. Uh, like Sidney Alderman. Yes. Uh, yes, Alderman had a major role. And then down in the committees, were the brains. Such uh, as, who were some of the who were some of the brains as you looked at that list? Sid Kaplan, Ben Kaplan, uh, Telford Taylor, Colonel Street, John Street, uh, Warren Farr. Bernie Meltzer. Boy, that's, I've forgotten all these names. Harriet Zetterberg. Murray Gerfine. There's Andy Wheeler. Almost every one of these now that I see it. I'm glad it brought back some memories. Yes. So this would have been September of 1945. In the chronology of things, you were, let me go back a little bit. You were in London and you were there with that initial group gathering documents and sort of orchestrating it. And there. mostly. Yeah, I was putting together document, documentary material, uh, and the purpose of the group there, though, was to set up the court. Mm -hmm. Jackson had to keep in touch with the United States Embassy, with the State Department, uh, uh, and it was a big job to uh, get an agreement on the defendants, and then to get an agreement on the principles of the court, and then put it in writing. Did you get a sense of the frustration of Jackson and the negotiating committee during that time period? Yes, because the, the other countries were quite 
dogmatic in their views, mm -hmm. but they generally, they, they, uh, everything got worked out. Right. And, and when the documents that were uncovered started coming in, uh, I quit going to MI6 because there was such massive stuff in such big volume that, uh, and, and so important that it would, I wasn't doing much extra good at MI6. So initially working with the British, it sort of helped you develop what information was out there. And then you were apparently getting a lot of information from our own people. Yes. Did you, now when you got all this information, did you feel obligated to share it with MI6 or were you sort of gathering it for yourself? I felt I was gathering it for everybody. Right. And, and we left London and went to Paris for a short time, went until the courthouse was ready, and then we went to Nuremberg. And I had a wing, and tons of employees, many of them prisoners of war, with the documents. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would get, sometimes I'd go out to the airport and pick up documents that were coming in in great volume on the plane. Uh, but they just poured in from every source. As you were looking at these documents as they were pouring in, were there a couple that you recall today here in 2008 where you just jumped off and said, my God, I can't believe what I have in my hands. Was there that kind of document or? I have one. Do you really? Yes. Okay. On October 5th, 1943, mm -hmm. there was a German engineer mm -hmm. was assigned to go to Russia behind the front lines mm -hmm. where there was a tank factory that made half a track uh, tracks for tanks to go on. And the Germans had captured German, uh, uh, Russian tanks which had broken tracks. So he, this factory was used to make new tracks to put on the Russian uh, tanks to give them to the Germans. And this man had nothing to do with the military but he was an engineer. Mm -hmm. He was told that the uh, SS units behind the front lines about where he was, or, or somewhere behind the front lines, were killing Jews. Mm to watch out because he had a lot of Jewish employees. All the Jewish employees wore an insignia on their chest. One morning he came to work and there were no Jewish employees. Mm. Uh, he was told that they were carted off down the road, so he went down the road looking for them. And he walked down the road with the mailman There in the company of Monarchy, I drove to the construction area and saw in its vicinity a heap of earth about 30 meters long, two meters high. Several trucks stood in front of the heap. Armed Ukrainian militia chased the people off the trucks under the supervision of the SS. 
The militia, militia men were guards on the trucks that drove them to and from the exhibitions. All these people had the prescribed yellow badges on the front and backs of their clothes and thus were recognized as Jews. Menachees and I went to the exca excavation. Nobody bothered us. Now we heard shots in quick succession from the, behind one of the earth mounds. The people who had gotten off the trucks, men, women, and children of all ages, had to undress under the orders of an SS man who carried a riding or dog whip. They had to put down their clothes in fixed places, sorted according to shoes, over and under clothing. I saw piles of shoes of about 800 to 1,000 pairs, great piles of laundry and clothing. Without screaming or crying, these people undressed, stood around by families, kissed each other, said farewell, and waited for the nod of another SS man who stood near, near the excavation also with a whip in his hand. During the 15 minutes that I stood near the excavation, I've heard no complaints and no requests for money, for mercy. I watched a family of about eight persons, a man and a woman, both about 50 with their children, about one, eight, and 10, and two grown-up daughters, about 20 to 24. An old woman with snow-white hair held the one-year-old child in her arms and sang for it and tickled it. The child was squealing from joy. The couple looked on with tears in their eyes. The father held a boy of about 10 years old and spoke to him softly. The boy was fighting his tears. The father pointed to the sky, fondling his hand and seeming to explain something to him. At that moment, the SS man at the excavation called something to his comrades. The later counted off about 20 persons and instructed them to walk behind the earth mound. Among them was the family which I had mentioned. I remember very well a girl, black-haired and slender, passing near me and she pointed at herself and said, 23 years. I walked around the mound and stood in front of a tremendous grave. Closely pressed together were people lying on top of each other so that only their heads were vis visible. Several of the people shot still moved. Some lifted their arms and turned their heads to show that they were still alive. The excavation was already two-thirds full. I estimated it had contained about a thousand people. I looked for the man who did the shooting and I saw an SS man who sat at the rim of the narrow edge of the excavation, his feet dangling in the excavation. On his knee, he had a, mean, a machine gun, uh, a machine pistol, and was smoking a cigarette. The completely naked people descended a stairway, which was dug into the clay of the excavation and slipped over the head of the, and slipped over the head of the people lying there, already to place, to the place which the SS man directed them. They laid themselves in front of the dead or injured people. Some touched tenderly those who were still alive and spoke to them uh, in a low voice. Then I heard a number of shots. I looked into the excavation and saw the bodies jerked or the heads rested almost motionless on top of the bodies that lay before him. Uh, I won't read any more, but uh, uh, this kind of group. Who, who wrote that letter? The, the, the manager. Uh, it's an affidavit. It's an affidavit. Uh, the, the manager of the uh, plant who was looking for his employees. Was that gravy? Was I, I remember that? Yes. That the guy. Oh my How God. do you remember that? I remember reading about the famous affidavit of gravy, and that's it, huh? Oh yeah. Oh, golly. My goodness, I, I, uh, you know, and then, then they watched the trucks and the trucks went somewhere else and they dug another pit and they took another thousand people yeah. until they got most of the Jews in that area. Wow, so that must take your breath away when you read that for the first time. Yes, it did. Yes, and it stuck with me. A matter of fact, after the trial, 
Justin uh, uh, Jackson asked me to take the movie that we made and show it in uh, legal circles. Mm -hmm. And I remember at one of those showings in, in, in Illinois, reading this and women breaking out in tears. Oh, yeah. It was very moving. When you moved to Nuremberg, were you in, where did you stay? Where, what was your, where was your residence in Nuremberg? I think I first stayed in the Grand Hotel. Right. But when, I, when, uh, I was in charge of all the documentary evidence. I had them translated. I was liaison with the uh, German lawyers for the defendants and had to supply them documents. And so that I would be closer to the top prosecutors, they, I moved into a house in something Dombach. Firth, Dombach? Yes. Yeah. How do you know all these well, things? We've been to Firth. I've been to Firth. How come? We were at the Nuremberg Courthouse, and we've spent two or three times. The Jackson Center has been in, in oh. Nuremberg, yeah. And, and I was four houses away from Jackson. No kidding. So I could, you know, go over with documents. And the British uh, prosecutors had houses near there. Did you, while in Firth, I and that's, of course, Jackson at 33, um, oh man, just drawing a blank, Lindenstrasse. Lindenstrasse was his house. Uh, did you have reason to go to his house there and work with him? With documents, yes. Was that a frequently, did you do that? Did you go over there and? Uh, yes, for a while. Uh, in that house, uh, I think it was Bill Jackson was, was staying there. And uh, his bodyguard, who's still alive, uh, Moritz Fuchs. Is yes, I, re I remember it. Yeah, he's, he's still there. And Elsie Douglas. Yes. And uh, the housekeepers and stuff. And is Elsie still alive? Elsie is not alive. No, she passed away. Uh, so, did you get involved in, in the creating of the opening statement at all? Providing documents for it. Yeah. Did he ever sit down like you and I are talking and, and say, Roger, I got some thoughts. What do you, what do you think? Did he, no. he, did he do that much? Did he, did he sit down with his staff at all? With Bill. With Bill? Uh, uh, no. Uh, Well, Telford Taylor had a segment of the case, mm -hmm. which was very important. Right. And I had to take documents into Telford and to Lofty Becker and the people with him. And uh, <clears throat> Jackson said to me once, how's Telford Taylor's case coming? Is he doing a good job? Uh, now, he was asking me about one of the top four or five people under him. Uh, and he's reported to have said, and I don't know whether I heard it or not, that he was not a very good administrator because he didn't like to do it. Mm -hmm. But he didn't. Uh, I was closer to him than a lot of the big shots. Right, right. And that's a tribute to you. And what, how, what did you see in him? And as far as strengths and weaknesses, since you were a little bit closer than even those guys on the sheet who may have been higher than you, you're, you're quite, you're up there. Well, uh, when, I flew in the plane with him at Christmas, and I'll come to that later. Sure. Uh, he would dictate to Elsie, mm -hmm. and the words that would come out spontaneously 
were just magnificent. Mm -hmm. I could never speak or write like that. Yeah. He had a tremendous ability with words. Uh, he had a very warm heart and a loyalty. And when there was a major dispute by two of his loyal supporters up at the top, instead of resolving it between them, he'd put it over here. Yeah. Uh, that happened on a few occasions. Uh, he was very warm-hearted. Well, on the Christmas trip, we went to Athens, and walking down the street, a very ordinary-looking man stopped him, and he was from Jamestown, New York. Really? And he was, you know, nothing to nothing special, but Jackson stood there and talked with him warmly and with enthusiasm for a long time, which surprised me. That's a story I have not heard. That's interesting. <laughs> Talk about that Christmas vacation. It, it sounded like, who went on this trip? Jackson, Elsie, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Gordon Dean and his secretary, uh, Roger Barrett and Bill, and General Gill and Venetis, who were Army, mm -hmm. sort of administrative. And, and, and I, in thinking about it much later, I decided that one of the reasons I was taken along was because I was a, Bill's age and would be sort of a companion with Bill, although we hadn't been particularly close. Right. We, we, we left Christmas for the Christmas vacation. We went to Athens. Mm -hmm to see Lincoln McVeigh, who was the American ambassador. Jackson said, I'm cold and I want to go somewhere where it's warm. And he picked Luxor. So we flew to Cairo, mm -hmm. rode camels out to the pyramids, spent some time in Cairo, and then flew to Luxor. Mm -hmm. and uh, shot hyenas from jeeps. Okay. <laughs> uh, one incident, uh, we were visiting the tombs across the Nile River, and the <clears throat> government guide who was helping explained one of the things he was showing. It was a scarab. Mm -hmm. And he explained that a scarab is a dung be beetle that lives on a dung heap. Mm -hmm. And Jackson said, I'd like to have one of those for a paperweight for the opinions of one of my fellow justices. <laughs> <laughs> Did he name the justice? No, but uh, there was it was well known. There was one justice. I hesitate to name him because I'm not entirely sure anymore. Well, I, I'll name it. Just uh, Hugo Black. What? Hugo yeah, Black. Black. Yeah, yes. And he. Uh, 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 it was obvious for Black, and another thing. Was it Frankfurter on the court that he was the closest to? Correct. Frankfurter would go to the office in the morning walking down the street with Charlie Horsky, mm -hmm. whom I got to know. And Charlie Horsky would learn from Frankfurter all the scuttlebutt that was going on in the court. And then he'd send it over to, to us. And sometimes it would come through me. Is that right? <laughs> now, that's how I knew about it. So, so you were the, the, the liaison, the information, the documents that come to you that on those way to Jackson, is that would be a normal route of a document? Not for mail. No, just, okay. Well, documents all came to me. Right. Uh, Interesting. Now, was Horsky sort of 
the uh, on the ground in Washington liaison for Jackson and the court? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, not with the court. You know. Just for Jackson. Oh, just for Jackson. But he was close to the court. I see. Back to the the uh, the documents. The trial starts in November 21st, 1945. Were you there the first yes. day, the opening yes, I day? I sat the first chair from Jackson when he delivered his opening statement. Wow. And it was one of the most brilliant pieces of judiciary I'd ever heard. We've we read the reaction in the newspapers, but what was the reaction in the audience at the time? Did you get a sense that they knew they were listening to something special? Nothing that showed how much, but they were all paid very close attention. The audience wasn't that large, uh, you know. There were several rows of lawyers and the press way in the back. And I'm not, I don't even know what the press said about it. When Jackson concluded his opening statement, uh, did, you, did he happen to mention his feelings about it? Did he happen to say, gee, I think I did well today? Or did you get any, any feedback from no. him? No. Uh, being so close, and was that your normal seat throughout yes. the trial? Well, uh, when documents came, I brought them in. And when they introduced him, Harold Willie was the clerk of the court, the clerk of the Supreme Court once, and I would uh, get them properly marked and into evidence. Uh, so I sat right opposite. Now, would you meet with the prosecutors before that day to know what documents to bring over? Was oh yeah, yeah. They would. Would they give you a list? So the day before, they would give you a list and say, Roger, here are the documents I want to introduce into evidence. Can you bring them? Is that how that would work? You know, I don't remember. I was trying to think of that. I don't remember. You know, we, we the documents mostly were in German. Uh. And I don't remember how I selected to be translated. Sections were translated. If the, then I, I knew what lawyers would be interested in what material, uh, and uh, then we would they would t say what they wanted the whole things translated, and the translators would take care of that. I don't remember that much about those mechanics. Yeah. I, I remember once uh, once I. Uh, went to Dachau to pick up some evidence. Mm -hmm. And the people half a mile away professed complete ignorance of what had gone on there. Right. Yet when they turned on the crematoria lights, everybody's lights went down at night. Yeah. And when the prisoners were marched into Munich to work, uh, and marched back. If they s sloughed off a little, they'd be shot and scraped into the gutter. Uh, anyway, I got one of the things I brought back were shrunken heads, mm -hmm. which the, 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 they learned to shake, shrink the heads of prisoners after they k killed them with the sign of the rope around their neck. And I had two of those shunken heads, and I put them in a paper bag, and I sent them into Justice Jackson. But I told the corporal, gee, I don't remember this, whose name was Cardoza, and we called him Benjamin. And I said, Benjamin, take this into Justice Jackson, but don't open it. And just as soon as he got away from us outside my door, he let out a big scream, and he'd opened it and seen his two shrunken heads in there. Oh my gosh. Now, were those the same heads that you see uh, Thomas Dodd uh, presented those into evidence? There's always, there's a picture yes. that, so you would have got those from Dachau, huh? 
Also, the shades themselves. The yes. Sh oh my gosh. Human skin. How do you know so much about the trial? Oh, I've studied it for some time. Have you? Yeah. Gosh. And I'm just thrilled to be with a guy who was there and <laughs> was, made it all happen. Um, one of the earlier, well, let's, another thing was Jackson at early stages was having some conversations with his staff regarding whether it would be a more of a document case as opposed to a witness case. And I know that led to a dispute with Wild Bill Donovan. What was your sense of, or take of that whole, uh, I don't want to say confrontation, but uh, uh, they, they certainly didn't agree on the philosophy of the conducting of the trial? Well, I was glad to see that shift made mm -hmm. because that much in documents was sort of boring mm -hmm. uh, for the press, for, for everybody. Right. The, the personality, the, the Donovan, Jackson personality conflicts, did you appreciate that that was going on while yes. you were there? Yes. How would it manifest itself? Would it just these guys walk out of the rooms or were they confrontational at meetings? No, just the, the, yeah, the way they interacted. Right. Ultimately? So, uh, uh, General Donovan had a lieutenant, had, a, had an officer named Donovan. Jim, Jim Donovan. Jim Donovan, whom he left there and who worked very well with everybody. Mm -hmm. And he sort of, when, when General Donovan was still there, he uh, mediated. Jim Donovan was the one who actually introduced that uh, concentration camp movie. Yes. And did, had you seen that beforehand? Did you know what was going to come? No. No, but uh, as I remember it, the movie had two parts the rise and then the fall. Mm -hmm. And this was the Nazi plan. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And when it got up here, was the intermission, and Jackson, um, Gehring, with whom I'd spent several hours, which I'll tell you about, sat uh, not, not, not as far away from me as the other end of the room, mm -hmm. and as I passed by him, and he talked about Hitler on the screen, and he said, you know, couldn't you feel his strength or the strength of his presence? Something very admirable. Mm -hmm. And w was beaming all over. And then at the end of the day, after the, all the concentration camp material went in, uh, a lot of them had almost tears in their eyes, right. but they all looked ashamed. But Gehring was never ashamed of anything. You had, did have a chance to interview him, didn't you? Yes. Uh, uh, John Amon was head of interrogation, and he jealously guarded the prisoners from anybody else talking to him. But because I had documents which had to be discussed with people, I was an exception. So I had a better part of a day or half a day's session alone with Gehring. Uh, he asked, said he had to have an interpreter there, so there were three of us. But near the beginning, he called Hess a Schweinhund. And the translator said, Hess is a pig dog. And Gehring said, that isn't what it means. It has a much more sinister meaning. And, you know, explained it to him. So I knew he knew English very well. And uh, he was very bright, a nice sense of humor, tremendous ego, 
completely amoral, proud of everything that was done. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, Captain or Lieutenant or whatever I was at the time, you're not conducting this uh, session the way you're supposed to. We almost won the war. We would have won the war if we hadn't turned against Russia. If we'd won the war, you'd be wearing a prisoner's uniform, not a military, jail prisoners, black and white stripes. Mm -hmm. and you'd be standing at attention. Uh, and there'd be two SS soldiers standing behind you with bayonets in your butt. And you'd be saying, yes, General Goering. No, General Goering. That's the way you ought to handle me. You know. Um, when you, was that the first time you had met him or saw him? First time I'd met him. Yeah. So you, you walk into the room and there's Hermann Goering, the guy who's been on newsreels, have been newspapers. What was your personal reaction to it? Was there, was there any sense of awe or? No, he had a powder blue or powder gray uniform without any buttons. Yeah. Uh, and uh, looks sort of uh, not effeminate, but uh, not like a big military general. Yeah. Uh, and uh, no awe. Uh, yeah. um, but uh, one of the documents that I introduced was a telephone conversation between Goering and the Luftwaffe, uh, Luftwaffe headquarters in Germany and Seiss Inquart, who was the Quisling in Austria. Mm -hmm. This was in 1938. And Goering said to Seiss Inquart, cause some disturbance, do some damage, disrupt the city, uh, so that we can blame it on the communists. And for a week or two, he'd call back and ask how things were going, and they weren't going quickly enough. And Gehring would give additional instructions on what to do. And then finally, finally he said, all right, take this letter and have Chancellor Schusnig sign it. And the letter, in effect, said, I can't control my country. The communists are taking over. March in and save me. And Sy Sinkart called back and said, Schusnig won't sign it. And Goering said, sign his name and send it. Uh, and this was quite dramatic and quite damning. And as I, when the lights went on, he called me over. And he said, Captain, you introduced that as Luftwaffe headquarters, and Seiss Inquart, it wasn't. I was using the facilities, it was Hermann Goering. Would you correct the record? <laughs> <laughs> he wanted full credit for it. Oh my gosh. Now both Seiss Inquart and Goering being defendants, you were involved in sort of sitting down and writing up at least a, a, a preliminary list or a list of potential defendants and some of the subject matter. How did that work? I think it was oral. Oral? Yeah. I've forgotten those sessions, but I had lists that I made up, and, but uh, uh, my list came out of documents in the British intelligence and other places, and I didn't know that much about the country or its history right. or what had been going on, so my list wasn't very useful. Well, who would you give it to? Who would see? Who would listen to the, your? Probably Colonel Story. Story. So he was your uh, immediate superior. Yes. Being in charge of the documentation division, 
put you at really a, one of the most responsible jobs in the, at Nuremberg. Did you have a desire to ever go on the other side of the podium and uh, present a case? Or did, is that something you had an, an interest in doing at some point? Well, A, I was so low on the totem pole, <laughs> I probably wasn't eligible. Uh, and B, no, I was completely absorbed by the work I was doing. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of interplay with all the lawyers and what they were doing and the subject matter. And I mean, it, was, it was hard work, you know, 10, 10 or 12 hours a day, every day. Did you get involved at all in any of the strategy of the case, you know, uh, so that you would uh, possibly, having seen a lot of the documents, sit down with uh, Amen or Story or whoever and say, "Gee, I think we should really focus in no. on this." Thing. No. What a, what a challenge you had with just orchestrating that immense amount of documents. It, and your relationships went beyond just the United States prosecution team. It went to all the other ones as well, didn't it? What was your sense of, of the Russian prosecution team? Well, once I was taking a bunch of documents in there, and Rudenko, the chief prosecutor, was on the floor with two others playing with toys from the PX. No kidding. Yeah. Uh, there was one officer, I don't remember his name, who came from Stalin's hometown in Georgia. Mm -hmm. And he was wiser and older and uh, more congenial than most of the Russian staff. I had, remember, a fair amount of dealing with him. And the, the brilliance stuck out of the British staff uh, and a good part of the American staff. Outside of Jackson, who were sort of the stellar prosecutors that, that come to mind? The second British prosecutor, mm -hmm. the first one was Lord somebody. Shawcross. Shawcross. Sir Harley Shawcross. Right, exactly. And his successor. Maxwell Fife. Maxwell Fife. Right. Was uh, the, uh, out, uh, an outstanding one. And on the United States side, there, were there a couple of those that you said, gee, they really did a great job as prosecutors? Yeah, well, I started to tell an anecdote, which I shall. Okay. Sam Harris, mm -hmm. who was brilliant and went on to be a senior partner of an important law firm, uh, stood up and said, the noise you, this is before the whole court and the whole world, the noise you hear is my nearest knees knocking. Oh my gosh. I haven't been this nervous since I proposed to my dear wife so-and-so. And then he went on and made a beautiful presentation. And afterwards, he leaned over and said to me, did I say anything to him? And then I went to the press as Gordon Dean must have been our principal press man to keep it out of the press. But I got a message that the British associate judge, I've forgotten his name, wanted to see Captain Harris. Burkett. Well, judge, judge Burkett. Sir Norman Burkett. Yeah. He wanted to see Captain Harris. So I got Sam and sent him in. And when Sam came out, I expected him to be 
beaten and whipped and Sam had a big smile and told me everything they did and and he one of the only things that was significant was that the Burke had told him something about boo-boos he committed as a young <laughs> a lawyer. No kidding. Oh. That's a quite a story. Your mother was, uh, was she German? You spoke German, didn't you? Yes. And she, was she German or Austrian or? Austrian. Given that background, did, did you have an emo kind of a more than a normal emotional tie into this case? No. Uh, I traveled the, a lot of the country, mm -hmm. but uh, I didn't have an emotional tie. As a matter of fact, uh, see, I'd forgotten this. When I was doing undercover work in Washington, mm -hmm. I got a call once to go down to the terminal. And they said there's a high-ranking officer that's got a German prisoner, uh, and he's having a sandwich in, in the cafe in the station. I got down there and didn't get him. But it was my cousin, who was a high-ranking officer in the German army, okay. who was being taken to a prison camp in Louisiana. And once, before I went to officer school, a senior partner in a New York law firm who had great authority uh, was going to get me appointed to an intelligence unit as an officer. But he said, we find you have a, a ranking relative on the other side and we can't do it. <laughs> but I had no emotional connect. My daughter is a sculptress in Germany and has lived there for how many years? Yeah. Oh my God. But uh, and she's very successful. Yeah. But and I visited, but I have no emotional ties. Yeah. I'm going to change the tape here because I got a few more good questions for you because you're terrific. This is fabulous. Excuse me.